So I think it's best just to dive into uh, our today's workshop. So David, please take the floor. Thanks so much, Dinah. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to day three. This is a hard day. Uh, you've got to take uh, all of the wonderful energy that you have been putting into your businesses and these ideas and these projects um, for the last 48 hours and turn it into something that you can communicate to somebody else. Um, and you've got to take all of your ideas and your insights and these wonderful challenges that you're looking to overcome and communicate them out to somebody. Um, so this is, a, this is a great day where it turns from thinking about it and talking about it and planning and actually presenting it to somebody else and, and, and trying to help somebody else understand why you have uh, all of this wonderful enthusiasm that's actually getting you up uh, on a Sunday morning, on a sunny Sunday, and choosing to spend your time uh, on this call with us. So uh, thank you very much for choosing to spend your time here. And uh, I, I'd like to just you know, state my uh, uh, admiration for everybody who's uh, involved in this, uh, from the organizers right down to you guys. Um, so just a little bit about myself, let me get my slides going. So um, I guess throughout my career, I guess I've been spending the last say 20 years or so working with innovators, with entrepreneurs. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been surrounded, I've been very lucky that uh, throughout my career, I've been surrounded by people who are interested in solving big problems. Um, and I, I've, I've acted in some ways as a coach, in some ways as a mentor. I spent quite some time in working as an investor in early stage startup businesses. So just running that through, um, I spent over a decade working with Enterprise Ireland, um, which is the Irish government's uh, agency helping entrepreneurs take their products and their services to a global market. So I helped from a trade development perspective, but also from an investment perspective. I was five years with a fund in Dublin called NDRC. Um, I made about 100 investments, um, cash uh, for, for, for equity um, on, uh, investments there, mostly into digital technologies and extremely early stage companies. So quite often I was investing before somebody had a, a product. Uh, and almost always before somebody had a customer. Um, so huge amount of those businesses failed, and then some of them went on to do very, very well. Um, but I suppose over those five years, uh, I probably said no to about 2,000 entrepreneurs, uh, turned them down for investment. So I got an opportunity to see a lot of people pitching at me, and I got a really good sense of what works when you're trying to convince somebody to give you something and what doesn't work. Um, I've also had uh, the, the, the opportunity and been fortunate enough to run, a, a, you know, an organization in Dublin kind of similar to the Startup Weekend. It was called Startup Grind, and it was an education community that delivered education through, a, um, through an event series, and I did that for four years. Now, I suppose, just to give you a kind of sense of, of, of the kind of work I'm involved with at the moment, so I, I, I run a company, uh, an innovation consultancy called Resolve Partners. We are uh, an innovation and, and um, uh, venture uh, investment company. We work with early stage startups, we work with multinational companies, we work with universities to help them understand the value of the innovation that they're doing, particularly around research and turning that into a commercial opportunity. We are incredibly focused in the area of sustainability. So I've been writing and building a community around the sustainable development goals. If you're interested in impact investment in innovation for um, sustainability uh, and all of those with an Irish lens, uh, I write a newsletter every, every every fortnight, kind of rounding up the um, the, the news and innovation um, from that space there. So that's just a little bit about me to kind of give you my thoughts around pitching. And I suppose the most important piece to take away from that is the, ex the, the major experience that I have is in pitching for investment. So, so I suppose some of the thoughts that I will be sharing are, 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 are coming from that particular perspective, okay? Feel free to ask any questions. And the other thing is, I meant, as I meant to say this, uh, it's my son's 10th birthday this morning and he actually we gave him a drum uh, and, I, and, and I'm questioning how smart that was already so if there's like huge amounts of drumming noise in the background don't panic it's just my son he's playing the drums in the background so let's move on so we're going to talk this morning about pitching okay and uh, he, here's the reality of talk, you know about pitching either pitching for investment or pitching to convince somebody or pitching to motivate somebody it is a very unnatural form of communication, okay? Standing by yourself in front of a group of people, or, you know, if it's on Zoom remote, but you're still, you know, you're still, you know, one to many talking for a period of time, it's very unnatural. It isn't a good way to communicate. It's difficult to build a relationship. It's difficult for you to 
understand whether the audience is interested or not and whether or not they're interested in you keeping on talking or if they're confused or whatever happens to be. That problem of an unnatural form of communication is actually made worse, unfortunately, when you're, you, when you're doing this on Zoom, okay? Because you're not even in the room with somebody. It becomes even more difficult to do that, okay? So it's a big challenge and nobody is good at this automatically, okay? Uh, nobody is completely natural at presenting and pitching. Because as I said, it's, it's not an intuitive way to communicate with somebody. So this is a, a skill that must be learned and it is a skill that must be practiced. So it's a necessary evil. But what we're going to do is we're going to, in, in, in the brief bit of time that I have this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can be as impactful as you possibly can this afternoon when you do your three minute pitches, you know, what the judges are going to be looking for and the things that you need to focus on, and then talk very briefly as well about maybe some of the pitfalls and maybe some of the things that you should avoid doing as part of the pitch, okay? So three minutes. Three minutes is an extremely short amount of time for which you can communicate your message out, okay? It is going to go much faster than you had anticipated. And when you think about it, when you break it down, the, the, you know, the very, very best sort of you know, media presenters, people you see reading the news, people you see you know, doing interviews and things like that who've had media training, at best, they're going to do about 150 words a minute. You know? So above about 150 words a minute, you actually start becoming unclear. You start losing the message because you're going so quickly that you're, 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 you're confusing the audience and you're losing the audience. So in reality, you've only got about 450 words. And I would actually, you know, I would, I would push to trim that down. I would aim for about 400. Um, you know, so something between 400 and 500 words will take you three minutes to say, okay? So when you, when you, when you, when you maybe if you stop and let that sink in and you think, I've only got 450 words, you need to then become very specific and very thoughtful and intentional about the language that you're using, okay? So I think, I think the, the, the first takeaway from this session is be mindful of your word count and be mindful about what it is that you're trying to communicate within that 450 words, okay? So I'm gonna talk just quickly through the guidelines. These are the sort of the high level guidelines that the judges um, this afternoon are going to be evaluating each of your pitches on, okay? So within this three minute block of time, you absolutely need to make sure that you're communicating on all of these points, okay? So these are broad and, and, and within each of these sort of top level criteria, there are a lot of different, you know, other calculations and criteria and weightings and bits and pieces like that that the judges are going to be looking for. So there's lots of stuff within these, okay? But broadly, they're trying to understand, have you done some work to understand how you can think about this plan and turn it into a successful business, okay? So this is your model. This is the business model. And the business model has lots of different components on it, okay? So it's going to have the customer, it's going to have the solution, it's going to have your pricing, it's going to have your distribution, it's going to have... Um, your competitors in there as well. Okay, so you kind of need to make, be able to make sure you're communicating on all of that. So that's business model. Customer validation is the second big criteria. So you need to be able to demonstrate that this isn't something that you just made up on Friday and sounds interesting. Okay, so you can communicate well on something that's entirely fictional. Uh, you know, you can just make it up and tell a good story, but the judges are going to be working really hard to make sure that the work, the effort that you've put in to um, uh, it, it, you know, to validate these, uh, these, these, these pieces of the business model that you have assumptions around that you've done a bit of work around, okay? The last one, then execution and design, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to spend too long talking about that. I'm sure Leila and Diana have, have spent time talking to you guys about MVP and, and, and what you're trying to do there. But they're, again, this kind of follows on from the validation because what we're interested in here is understanding the work that you've done, the guesses that you've, you, 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 you've tried to test, testing a guess and doing an experiment to see whether or not somebody really has a problem or not or whether somebody really wants a solution that's part of the validation but that's part of your MVP as well the other piece of the MVP is can you in some way 
give an indication of what a solution might look like. So you're, you know, if you're, if you're, if you think that you're going to build some sort of a solution, could you maybe show a prototype of it? Could you show some sort of a, you know, uh, e e even you know, a set of slides with images on them that say this is how the service might work, this is how the product might look in the, in the end. Okay. These are the three criteria. Okay. And from a storytelling perspective. If it was me and I was doing this as, as, as my three minute exercise, I would build it in this flow that I've identified here, okay? I would start by talking about the validation, okay? Are you building something that people actually want, right? Because if you're not building something that people actually want, why on earth are you continuing to talk about it? Why on earth are you continuing to talk about the business model if it's got nothing to do with reality, right? Uh, so start by talking about the problem, start by talking about the customer, then go on to talk about the tests that you've run. What did you actually do? Okay, what did you execute on that helped validate what you were trying to um, trying to build? And then the third piece of that then is talk about the business model. Okay, now this isn't prescriptive, but if it was me, this is how I would go about building up a deck. Okay, and I would structure it like like like, like, like I was saying there. Talk about the problem. Okay, be really really specific about the problem. Okay, and by that I mean, as an example, you don't go in and lead and say, I'm solving world hunger, okay? Um, because people are still going to be hungry even if you're successful. What you can say is, you know, you might say, there's a specific part of a supply chain around getting material to an NGO that isn't working very well at the moment, and we're fixing one specific piece of why that supply chain isn't working. OK, or we're getting data about how that NGO is going about its business and we can help them become better. Get to the very, very specific problem that you're solving. OK, rather than standing up and saying world hunger is awful and I'm going to fix this tiny little piece of the NGO piece over here. It, 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 it doesn't really do you credit to the problem and your understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve. OK, to so be specific about the problem and be specific about how a customer experiences it. What I'm trying to understand here is how a customer behaves when they know they have the problem and how a customer will be able to behave when the problem is taken away, okay? So specific on a problem and specific on a customer behavior. This is such an important part of the, of, of the pitch that if it was me, I would probably spend about half of my time talking about the problem and the, and, 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 and the customer, okay? So no more than about a minute and a half, but at least a minute. Um, 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 uh, you, you know, as a recommendation on that. Then, as I said, you've got some guesses about how the customer experiences the problem. You've got some, cost some guesses maybe about how your competitors are fixing the problem and whether or not your customers might be happy about, about, about how that's going. What's the effort that you've gone to to determine how true that is, okay? So you started on Friday with maybe some instinct, maybe an empathy level um, connection with the problem. So sort of, I think customers are pissed off about this. What did you do to actually go and validate that, okay? And you can probably do that in about 30 seconds. We ran a survey, we built a landing page, we went out to the street and we talked to people, whatever it happens to be, what did you actually do? What did you spend your time doing? And you finally explained the business model. And the business model is based as much as possible on the insights that you've gathered, okay? So insights is where you talk to somebody about your problems and you make some sort of you know, cognitive leap. It's like, oh, those customers are fixing the problem in a certain way. They're experiencing this problem and it's pissing them off. I'm going to fix it for them in a particular way. And the insights then let you say, here's my model, here's my solution, here's my pricing, here's how I'm going to make money, and here's how I'm going to beat the competition. Okay. And you need to spend about a minute on that because it's that it's that inflection point where you go from I've tried to earn learn something and now I'm going to implement something. Okay. So again. <clears throat> I'm going to share these slides. Uh, this is not a prescriptive template for you, but if it was me and I had three minutes to talk about the work I'd done over the weekend, this is the kind of flow that allows you to tell a very clean narrative about the problem that you're trying to fix, okay? So let's talk a little bit about some do's and don'ts, okay? The very first thing that you should do when you finish this call at 11 o'clock is start writing a script, okay? Everything flows from a script. Open up a fresh Google document page, whatever it happens to be, whatever tools you're using in the team, and write down 450 words, and then stop writing, and then go back and read it again and throw it all away, and write another 450 words, okay? You don't need to read from the script when you're doing your presentation later on, although some of you might want to. That's okay, 
okay, it can help. But the, the discipline and the exercise of writing down the script and being comfortable with the script and thinking, have I communicated on all of these criteria? Have I built a narrative flow in three minutes? A script lets you do that. And then you finish your script and you think, okay, what slides can I use now to illustrate what I'm talking about? What slides can I use? What content can I put onto a screen that emphasizes and supports the story that I'm telling, okay? You, you, you will get so much value out of this exercise of writing down your script and not thinking about your slides until you're comfortable with where the, the, the script is. What you'll find is you'll do multiple revisions of that. You'll do a little bit of script, you'll do a little bit of slides, you'll run through it and say, that didn't work so well. You know, slide two isn't, isn't, isn't exactly what we need and you'll revisit, okay? Please don't stuff your slides with loads and loads of information that is unnecessary, okay? You've got three minutes to communicate and you're going to be super excited, right? So you're going to be telling, trying to tell somebody everything at once about all the things that you're excited about. Trying to keep that in as simple of a way as possible will serve you very well, okay? This kind of a slide makes somebody just go crazy, okay? There's way too much information in a slide like this. Uh, there's no possible way that somebody looking at this slide will be able to uh, sort of like, you know, um, to take in the information that you're trying to communicate here. Really, what you're going to do is, for, for, for something like this is come across as quite arrogant and say, I know about this space so well. Look at all these amazing images and logos and stuff that I can talk to you about. And you're just overwhelming an audience. OK, so keeping it simple keeping them focused on the one piece of information that you're trying to communicate is much better than absolutely shoving everything you know into a slide, okay? Because here's the, you know, here's the truth. You don't have to pay for every new slide, okay? Slides are free. You can put as many slides as you want into a presentation. They don't charge you extra for putting an extra slide in, okay? So what you should try and focus on doing is saying, I've got one important thing that I need you to understand. I've got one really, really critical thing that you need to focus on on this slide. I'm going to tell you it, and here it is on the slide. So my slide is one message per slide, okay? Because if you put too much information onto a slide, it dilutes the impact of what you're trying to do. So this loop, the slides are free. Just do one thing per slide, because otherwise you dilute the message, okay? If you try and shove too much in there, it just overwhelms your audience, and they don't know what it is you want them to take away from it, okay? So that's really important. The other piece that you need to focus on is the fact that this is not a murder mystery game, okay? This is not a whodunit. This is not Cluedo. I want you to be very specific about what it is you're telling somebody. Make it really obvious who the villain is. <laughs> that's the problem that you're trying to fix. And make it really obvious who the hero is. And that's you and your solution coming in to fix the problem, okay? They shouldn't have to waste time looking at your slides going, I'm not sure anymore what problem is being solved, or I'm not sure why this solution is going to make things better. You've got to work as hard as you can at saying, here's the hero, here's the villain. Remember how bad things are when the villain is in control? We're going to fix that, okay? And not leave people doing the work of guessing. You've got to tell them what it is that they're going to come away from with this, uh, from, from this slide. I'm going to tell you why this problem is so important to solve. I'm going to tell you how easy it will be to do things once our solution is in reality. So make it very, very clear, particularly, as I said, because you've only got three minutes. The other piece of it is, and you'll have seen through my slides, you need to be able to communicate as quickly as you can. And for me, visuals are a really good way of doing that, okay? So really high quality visuals that communicate really fast what's going on, okay? So stock photography looks stupid, right? Nobody actually looks like these, these people do in real life. But we can really clearly see the difference between the people on the left-hand side and the people on the right-hand side. The people on the left-hand side are really, really pissed off, right? Maybe they got a bill that was too big. Maybe they can't afford their rent. I have no idea what's going on. But if you put up a slide describing the problem and you've got these people behind as your background, I'm going to get what you mean. You want me to see that they're annoyed. And then when you start talking about the solution and you say, oh, wow, look, everything is wonderful for this couple. You know, we've taken away their problem and then they can have lovely walks in the park. They're happy now that we've taken away their problem. So we, we reach for cliches and we reach for shortcuts to communicate because they work. Right. 
you know, we can communicate more than just the words we're saying. We're making people get this sense of this emotion, emotional connection with the problem by taking these shortcuts, okay? There's a reason why clowns have makeup that's like, you know, so big. It's so that you can make sure you see from the very, very back of the room whether or not the clown is smiling or the crown, clown is frowning, okay? So we want to be that obvious about how we communicate the problem um, as experienced by the customers. I'm nearly done. Okay. This really wrecks my head, okay? You've done so much work to talk about the problem. You've got so much effort gone into communicating and validating, and then you do your presentation and you do something like you misspell some words or you use the font color differently across the text or your font that starts the slide isn't the same font that ends the slide and it's a different size and it's a different font family it really undermines the message that you're trying to communicate, okay? It is so easy to undo all the good work that you've done by making these small mistakes, okay? You can be professional by putting a little bit of effort into the slides and making sure that the message is consistent and the visual is consistent and the language is right and the spellings are correct. If you can't figure this out, find somebody on your team who, who will be able to take a read of this and say, we're not using the right words here. This is incorrectly spelled. Take a couple of minutes because it makes such a difference to the judge who's sitting back there. Remember that, you know, we need to be respectful of the time of the judges. We're saying to you, I need three minutes of your time. I'd really like to tell you this story. And then you go and you misspell a word. And the judge is sitting there looking at the misspelled word and they've completely ignored everything else that you've said. And you're like, well, you may as well have just not done that weekend of hard work. Okay. So to come back to our poor chap who's terrified of public speaking, as I said at the outset, it's a really unnatural way for everybody to communicate and everybody will have some nerves when they're starting off. It's completely natural. Anybody who tells you that they're not nervous about presenting in public speaking is lying because everybody gets that way, okay? So what you gotta remember is that your role when you're talking to the judges this evening is to inform them, okay? You know something that they don't, and we're going to work hard to make sure that they communicate that and so they come away knowing it, okay? And you are making an attempt to persuade them that, you know, that what you've worked on is important and that you've done a good job of validating it and learning it and understanding it over the last couple of um, hours together. So that's what, your, that's what your job is, whoever is presenting, to inform and persuade. And remember that when you're, when, when, when you're doing the presentation. You know something that they don't, and you want to communicate that to, out to them. And the other trick with this is just to rehearse as much as you can. Now, I say that with as much respect as I can, knowing that you've got to do this later on this afternoon. But the more time that you can put into reading through your script out loud, even without the slides, and then, you know, when the slides are ready to communicate that and bring it together, the better it's going to be, the easier it's going to become. Use every support you need. If you, if you, if you, if you need to have the, 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 the script printed out uh, on, a, you know, on a desk in front of you, go for it. If you're able to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to, to memorize it, then great, go for that. But if you need every support available to you, take that, okay? So I have absolutely flown through 20 minutes worth of slides and that went really, really quickly. So I will leave you with some inspiring words from my favorite author, Sir Terry Pratchett. If you trust in yourself and believe in your dreams and follow your star, you'll still get beaten by people who spent their time working hard, learning things and weren't so lazy. And I said at the outset that I have just tremendous admiration for people who are willing to say, I want to work on fixing this problem. I'm going to give up my time to work hard over a weekend and see if we can figure out a way to build a team around solving um, one of these extremely problems, extremely important problems under the sustainable development goal. So I have huge admiration for you. I wish you all very well uh, this afternoon with your pitches. And I think we might have some time for questions, Diana, but I might have gone over, gone over a little bit. Yes, we have five minutes for the questions. So if any participants have questions, please. Can I ask a question, David? Siobhan, hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, David, would you recommend that one person present or could you split it into three? Or do you think, what, what's your best opinion on that? Uh, so for, ev for, for every person that you add to the presenting, um, I need it to be exponentially better, right? So two people needs to be at least twice as good as one person could be. Um, and uh, in three minutes, you're going to have 
a little bit of slippage as you do a handover and somebody else introduces themselves and you're going to lose 10, 15 seconds on that. I would advise no. I would advise single presenter. It's only three minutes. Uh, it'll just get messy, especially on Zoom. It'll, 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 it'll be all over the place. Unless somebody's in the room with you and you want to do it that way, but I, I would avoid it. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, yes, another question. So uh, what I might do is so I'm just going to pop my email address into the chat. Uh, and uh, if anybody wants to discuss what they're working on uh, or find out more about what we do, I'm happy to, to, uh, to chat and take this offline at some point. Yeah, thank you, David. It was, was uh, really useful information for our participants. Cool. Good. Well, good luck. So, and uh, I hope the day goes well. And uh, I hope this afternoon is fun. Remember, it is, is supposed to be fun. So don't forget to smile, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's and uh, this uh, weekend is for you just to test your idea and to see if it will, uh, will work in. That's why, as David said, it's very important to validate your idea through this weekend. 